Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Good to have you with us. The governments of Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru are holding an emergency meeting this week to discuss how to manage the steady flow of immigrants from Venezuela into their countries. For over a year now, migration from Venezuela to neighboring countries has been on the rise. Estimates of the numbers of Venezuelans leaving their country because of the economic crisis that they face have ranged from 1 million to as much as 3 million people in the past two or three years. Also, the migration has sparked a strong reaction, some might say a xenophobic reaction, in some countries. For example, in Brazil, the border town of Pacarema, local residents attacked camps of Venezuelans and burned down their tents and their belongings. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees issued a statement warning against such attacks. There were some deplorable images coming out of the region last week, and obviously we call for respect of refugees um, and people on the move in Latin America. Um, we are concerned about these recent events and the demonstrations against refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants in some of the Latin American countries. Those increase stigmatization of those who are forced to flee. They put at risk um, also the efforts for their integration. Uh, solidarity is actually the key here. Um, solidarity of the countries in the region and its citizens towards those displaced populations. Joining me now to analyze the situation of Venezuelan migration in Latin America is our own Greg Wilpert. Greg is the author of Changing Venezuela by Taking Power and is the co-founder of the website VenezuelanAnalysis.com. Here's my conversation with Greg Wilpert. All right, Greg, good to have you with us and I'm glad we're doing this. I've never done this with you before, so this is going to be exciting. But let, let me just back up here after the intro and I really want to, I think, explore for our viewers the underpinning of this migration. We've seen numbers that go anywhere from 650,000 to 2 million Venezuelans streaming across the border in Colombia, which is real, that part's real, but what is the reality? I mean, what do we know and what's, what's real and what's myth? Yes, one of the big issues is that uh, I think that um, the numbers tend to uh, be all over the place, as you mentioned. So uh, just for example, the United Nations has an index of migration where they estimate how many migrants are living abroad from all the different countries. And as of last year, it was approximately 650,000 Venezuelans living outside of their home country. Um, there's reason to believe that that has doubled since that, uh, since that survey was taken. So uh, it could very well be that, and this is corroborated by the numbers of people entering into the different countries, that is, you know, obviously Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, etc. They keep track of how many people are entering from Venezuela into their country. And if you look at those numbers, but you also have to pay attention to how many are leaving, because many journalists have this tendency sometimes to just look at how many are entering Colombia, but not how many Venezuelans are leaving Colombia. Same thing with Ecuador or Peru. And so if you look at all those numbers, my estimate estimate is, and according to the most authoritative figures I've seen, is that roughly one and a half million Venezuelans have left in the last three years approximately. Um, that is still a substantial number, but it's not the two to three million that is often mentioned. Though one of the things we're seeing is that a lot of the press, whether it's Reuters or BBC, Guardian, whoever's covering, all the people covering this, are all saying this is a crisis that's mounting and building, that they're liking it to the crisis of migration and immigration into Europe from Arab uh, nations and from the continent of Africa. But the way you're describing it, it sounds like it's not quite that bad, but that's clearly how they're making it sound. And and the Indian nations and others are calling for a major summit meeting in September. So, so there's a real mixed message about what the reality is. Yes, I mean, in terms of the numbers, I mean, certainly it's not reached the uh, extreme levels that uh, of migrants uh, are uh, refugees, really. I mean, I think one needs to distinguish uh, also, the, you know, the, obviously the people who are leaving Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq, they're leaving because of war and economic conditions, whereas in Venezuela, it's clearly uh, an economic crisis that has caused this. Uh, so that's the first main difference to keep in mind when looking at why so many people are leaving. Um, so that's a, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, a major um, major difference. But the other is, of course, the numbers. So we're, and we're not seeing the same numbers. We're talking, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the latest figures are, but uh, they're far more coming from the Middle East to Europe uh, than there are Venezuelans who are leaving to the rest of Latin America. But it's still a serious situation, and it's certainly creating pressure 
on the governments of Colombia, Peru, uh, Brazil, uh, Ecuador, uh, in terms of absorbing this large number of popula uh, large population, because these countries, uh, except for Colombia, are generally not used to this kind of migration. Colombia, I'm saying, is an exception because they've dealt with a 60-year uh, civil war where there's been enormous internal displacement and also migration outside of the country. Yeah, I mean, millions of people are displaced inside of Colombia because of the civil war in Colombia. It's one of those, when you read those numbers, they can even look larger because of the numbers of people internally uh, who are refugees inside their own nation. Um, but let me jump into this, the, the question of why this migration. Um, I've read accounts from people who have been on the border between Colombia and Venezuela. And mind you, they're writing for the New York Times, they're writing for the Washington Post, they're writing for uh, the Telegraph in London. But, but they're all saying similar things, that there are massive people fleeing because of economic dislocation, because of hyperinflation, not enough food to eat, can't buy chickens, and some making the argument as well that people are leaving out of, for political reasons. So, I mean, how do you parse that out? Well, certainly all of those uh, things are a factor. Um, uh, and the biggest is, of course, the lack of economic opportunity because of the hyperinflation, which has really brought the economy to a grinding halt because under conditions of hyperinflation, it's very difficult to run a business. Actually, it's practically impossible to really run a business and to, uh, to do business as usual. Uh, so I would say the main factor has really been the hyperinflation, which is why since the hyperinflation began roughly a year ago, maybe a little bit less than a year ago, um, the, uh, the migration has really kicked into high gear because, uh, since that started. Of course, it started before that. Another factor that is uh, perhaps not mentioned as often, but I see many people mentioning as a factor, is of course the high crime rate in Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela, uh, of course, you know, in a condition where the economic situation get, gets worse, it's well known that crime goes up as well. Um, and then, of course, we need to look at and go further back, I think, is also to look at, well, what is causing the economic crisis, which is, of course, something we've talked about in other programs on The Real News. Um, but I just want to quickly mention there, I see there's two main factors, which is very simplistic, but uh, one is certainly mistakes of the Maduro government, which should have adjusted the exchange rate uh, and didn't do that. Uh, it has this fixed exchange rate, which is causing all kinds of economic distortions and has caused a general loss of confidence in the, in the currency. Uh, which led to the hyperinflation. But the other major factor, I think, uh, that has led to hyperinflation is are the um, economic sanctions that uh, the United States has placed on Venezuela, uh, which has made it very difficult for the government to uh, finance uh, the things it needs to fund uh, because uh, oil revenues have uh, gotten very difficult to, to use and manipulate in the country because of the financial uh, sanctions that the United States has placed, which are very harsh. And uh, that has created a situation where the government either doesn't pay salaries or prints money to pay salaries. And so faced in that choice, they've tended to print the money, and therefore that has uh, further contributed towards hyperinflation. But what about the reaction of the, of the countries around Venezuela and the ones adjacent to those countries, all of whom are, many of whom, are changing their laws. So it used to be if you had an ID, a national ID, you could just walk into another country and that was it. But now they're saying we're demanding that you have passports, which means only the upper class can have them who had them before because it's harder to get passports now from what I've read in Venezuela. So there's, there's, what's that political dynamic? Yeah, that's one of the issues that they're certainly discussing now in, uh, in Colombia and uh, in uh, Ecuador, Ecuador and in Peru is to, to require passports. And actually Peru and Ecuador um, have, a, have an international treaty with Venezuela not to require uh, passports uh, for entry into these countries. Of course, they're hoping that this will uh, stem the flow of immigrants from Venezuela to their countries. But it's a huge mistake. Uh, studies have shown over and over again, every time you increase the barriers for entry, that just increases the uh, number of illegal immigration into that country and creates basically an underclass, which makes the, a bad situation even worse. because. And then people uh, cannot find jobs, uh, at least not legally, and uh, they, they're more likely to turn to crime instead uh, or to become totally underpaid because of their precarious situation. And therefore, much, uh, you end up with a much larger uh, class of people who are poor. And so uh, this is a real, it's a, it's a measure that looks like a short-term solution to their problem, which is to stem the flow of Venezuelans coming into the country. 
um, but uh, it's going to cause more problems. And of course, the other reason for why it's going to cause more problems is that in Venezuela, one of the problems right now is getting your hands on a passport because you know passports require certain printing mechanisms, certain special paper. Those need to be imported, and because Venezuela is suffering again from these kinds of sanctions. Um, uh, the financial sanctions been made it very, made it very difficult to uh, provide all the materials for making the passport. So there's a massive backlog, not, of course, because of the migration as well, a massive backlog in providing passports to Venezuelans. And so um, that's that's not going to you know it's not going to force Venezuelans to get passports faster because that's almost beyond their control at this point. So I wonder. I was going to jump right into Brazil, but let me ask this question first. Um, so. So if, if, that's the, if those are the issues that are fueling this emigration out of, <clears throat> from Venezuela to the neighboring countries, um, I mean, and, and if the sanctions are playing that deeper role, and you add to that Maduro's mismanagement of the economy as well, I mean, so what does that portend? I mean, you know, for a long time, Venezuela was at the heart of building this new alliance in, 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 in South America, and now we're seeing something else happen. So what, do you, what, do you, what does this portend? Well, um, I, I don't think you're prescient, but I'm just curious what you think. Well, it's, uh, it really depends on how the government itself interprets the situ uh, situation. Because um, on the one hand, if the government sees the uh, migration as being something that is uh, not that serious, uh, and in other words, that uh, then it doesn't, it doesn't feel the pressure that this migration is actually causing the government itself in the sense that uh, right now there's, a, uh, there's been a tremendous uh, brain drain from Venezuela, uh, which of course is going to hamper the economy for decades to come if these people don't come back. Now the government has introduced various new economic measures uh, last week that uh, it hopes will uh, uh, stop the hyperinflation and will uh, cause a reactivation of the economy. It's too early to see whether it's going to happen. Uh, but, um, but if it doesn't take the problem seriously enough, it's not going to be necessarily motivated to do more to stop that. So that's, that's the real danger. So the real question is, you know, to, how is the government going to perceive the problem? And uh, I mean, there's, there's, on the one hand, I see some government officials recognizing the problem. For example, uh, earlier last week, uh, late last week, uh, the communications minister actually issued an appeal to Venezuelans who've left the country to come back again. And so that there is clearly a recognition that something's going on, um, but um, but there's still a question as to whether the economic measures that have been introduced will go far enough. It's, most of the reports that I've read say that the vast majority of Venezuelans who are fleeing Venezuela for whatever reason want to go back. They're not looking for permanent residence in Ecuador or in Brazil or in Colombia or anywhere else. Yeah, I think that's very important to keep in mind. There's two things. There's, of course, there's a, a tremendous Venezuela. First of all, has a tremendous number of Colombians living in their country, and many of them. That's a large part of uh, the migration out of Venezuela is Colombians basically returning to Colombia. Uh, actually, the uh, Colombian government itself issued a report uh, where they did a survey and they calculated that something like two thirds of the people who'd been arriving and staying in Colombia were actually originally from Colombia. Um, and then only 5% were talking about staying in Colombia for an extended period, that is of the others, uh, of staying there for an ex extended period of time. And so there's definitely an intention of Venezuelans wanting to return when the economic conditions improve. And so that, that's why everything depends on what the economic conditions in Venezuela look like. So why do you think that the response in Brazil was so much more violent than in other countries, where Venezuelans were literally being attacked and burned out? Well, or the refugees were, whoever they are. Yeah, the, I mean, I think this is another major factor that uh, not enough attention has been paid to, uh, which is the um, kind of uh, xenophobia that uh, has uh, is floating around in Venezuela. I uh, sorry, in, in the rest of Latin America towards Venezuelans. And so, and I think in the case of Brazil, though, it's a special situation because the border region between Venezuela and Brazil is a relatively remote part of the of, of Brazil. And so the there's Amazonian not, province, Amazonia is there. Right. right, right. And so there's not much infrastructure, there's not much capacity to really uh, deal with uh, this inflow of migration. And so the local government and the local population has been uh, yeah, put under tremendous amount of pressure as long as those people aren't relocated to someplace inter inside of uh, Brazil. And so there's been also tension not only between, with the Venezuelans for between uh, that population, but also towards the rest of uh, the government, the central government uh, in Brazil because they haven't been doing enough to help them. So 
You know, just, just as here in the United States, when we talk about the emigration from <clears throat> Mexico and Central America into the United States, um, the, the, the people don't often understand the history of migration in our own country and how Mexico was, that most of Western United States was Mexico and, there, and the border meant very little until recently of going, people going back and forth. But there's, a, there's also some historical migration patterns in South America that are part of the story that are often left out. Yeah, I think that's also something very important to keep in mind. I mean, for um, decades, I mean, basically the entire 20th century, Venezuela was actually a country that has accepted um, and was one of the only, if not the only country to, for such an extended period of time to have accepted immigrants from other countries. This was before Chavez and the and his, Well before, you know, election actually, victories. already. I mean, of course, Latin America in general has been a, a place of uh, accepting migrants even from Europe, of course, before, you know, and shortly after the uh, Second World War. Um, but Venezuela, for a much longer period after the Second World War, still all the way up until the 1970s, 80s, and even into the 2000s uh, during the Chavez period, accepted far more migrants than it uh, than than left the country. Uh, so that's something very important to keep in mind. So this is a, a you know a kind of a historical first for Venezuela to have so many people leaving now. Um, and the other factor is uh, to keep in mind is that uh, Venezuela accepted somewhere between two and even some people say four million Colombians because who were displaced due to the civil war that we mentioned earlier. And so uh, Venezuela has always been very generous in that sense. Not even, and uh, Chavez at one point even decided to practically nationalize all the Colombians who were living, Ill, quote unquote, illegally in Venezuela. Nationalize means giving them citizenship? Yes. Is that what that means? Exactly. Okay. Uh, nat I should say naturalize. Is naturalize. I was correct. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so that's why they've become Venezuelans now, uh, even though they originally had a Colombian passport. Um, and so this is, uh, in, that, in that sense, it seems, especially to Venezuelans, a little bit unfair. Uh, the situation now that the tables are reversed, they're ha facing such a, a difficult time, far more difficult time in the other countries than they did uh, than when they were accepting uh, foreigners to Venezuela. Hmm. So the countries are calling for a conference in September. They're calling for other meetings to take place now to deal with this. I'm curious where you think those, those, those will lead. I mean, there are some friendly relations between some of those governments and Venezuela. There's some tensions between, between others that are getting more and more intense. So what does this lead us? And I think that, again, is important in light of what you seem to be saying, which is that the comparison between the emigration from Arab nations and Africa into Europe is not the same thing, which is how a lot of the press is kind of playing it. So those two things fitting together, what, how does that play into these meetings that are about to take place? Well, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what uh, those uh, meetings, of course, you know, what they can really decide. I mean, hopefully they will decide to make it easier for Venezuelans to live in those countries and to basically reciprocate what I was saying earlier about Venezuelan uh, hospitality in previous decades. Um, and so everything will depend on finally what kind of a decision do they reach. Now, of course, they could go in the other direction, uh, which has been the tendency until now, which is, you know, such as requiring passports. Another step further would be to actually require visas. Um, and uh, I mean, I doubt that it's going to go that far at this moment, but certainly the passport situation uh, is already a major complication uh, for Venezuelans. And like I said, also for the economies of these countries, because they're going to create this underclass. Um, but uh, it's very difficult to say which way it's going to go. I mean, the, the, and the, the, my, my guess, though, is given that most of the governments in the region are uh, right wing at this point, uh, they're going to do everything that they can to increase uh, or make life difficult, basically, for Venezuela. And um, that means to, uh, unfortunately, to also uh, thereby punish the, the Venezuelans who've immigrated uh, to their countries, I think. They're not going to make it easy for them. Although, who knows? Uh, you could just as well argue that it, by making it easier, that Venezuelans are going to lose more population and therefore, um, uh, you know, that's going to be more difficult for Venezuela as well. But I doubt they're going to think that way and they're going to make it more difficult, unfortunately. Well, we'll cover this a great deal more. This has been a great conversation. I've learned a lot. I hope our viewers, I think I know our viewers have as well. So great. We'll thank you so much. Good to have you with us. My pleasure. And for the Real News Network, I'm Mark Steiner. Thanks for joining us. Take care.